Hello and welcome to Mary's Eclectic Interests. My name is Sue Ellen Zagrebelny and I'll be your host today. Our guest is Christopher Schmitz. He has written a book that I will let him introduce and mm -hmm. um, go for it, Chris. All right, uh, well, my book, uh, it's one of many I've written. Uh, it's the one I'm, I'm very fond of, partly because I kind of wrote it, inspired uh, by my daughter, kind of for my daughter. Uh, my book is called Wolf of the Tesseract. Um, and uh, it's written as a piece of YA fiction, so it has a pretty broad appeal. It's, I often describe it as kind of a female Percy Jackson-like character uh, who has to essentially save all of reality from this this insane sorcerer who's trying to use her as a tool in order to kind of destroy everything that exists. Okay. <laughs> it's a big story packed into a, a small package, but books are like the TARDIS. They're bigger on the inside. Okay, okay. There's a quote um, in the book that kind of says it all. Would you be so kind as to read that? It's on 186, I believe. The quote you guys are talking about, uh, um, it's from the, uh, the character of Zabe is talking. He's, they're kind of skipping through different dimensional realities, um, trying to get to escape this, this sorcerer that's chasing them with all this, his, his kind of army of people. And this is where everything started, and he's explaining kind of the backstory to Claire, who's a just a college student from Duluth gets kind of caught up all in the middle of this. Uh, and Zabe tells her, he says, this is where it all started, where the philosophers and religious fanatics established reality from non-reality and birthed an ageless terror, calling the ancient A-God from a purely conceptual into the visceral, yet non-corporeal. It's all, it's very confusing. It's all, everything they just said is a complete and total contradiction of terms. Mm. Um, and it's, it's like physics where every every action has an equal and opposite reaction only on the the, uh, the spiritual and the philosophical dimension and realm and, and aspect when when we have something that exists then and if it exists in in a complete and awesome and amazing way uh, like a, a concept and theory of God then there must be something equally terrifying yet also not existing um, and it's kind of like when we're all, I mean, the most, const, the most basic fear in mankind is the fear of the dark. It's because when we can't see something, when there's, we're afraid of something that doesn't even exist, isn't really there, it's just, it's just not. Yeah, when you can't name something. Yes. And it's the fear of the unknown. And um, without giving away too much of the book, could you give our viewers a little taste of the characters and this universe of unreality. Sure. Um, well, there's two main characters. Uh, it would be a guy named Zabe who's from this different dimension where, uh, where magic and science are kind of just two sides of the same coin. And then there is Claire, who is the daughter of a guy who's an archaeologist. Um, who lives in Duluth. He's constantly away on um, different dig sites and things like that across the world. And he's, he's not here for most of the book, except for later when he kind of comes in in the end. It's kind of a bargaining chip when things start to really get dicey. But Zabe is trying to save, he's trying to save the princess of his reality, of his world. And all of these worlds, kind of, the, I use the word multiverse, which is not, not original to me at all, but kind of says it all. There's different, different universes all tied together with different connecting points. And those connecting points, they can travel back and forth if you know how. Usually places of great spiritual power or whatnot, like Stonehenge is one. Um, uh, there's a, a big cathedral that's another one that's uh, just a, a, it's a soft spot between the realms. And so when... When the princess, who's the person that Zabe is actually in love with, is, is kidnapped by this sorcerer, and the sorcerer knows that he can use her to end all of reality. Um, but he also knows that the sorcerer, as much as he's a religious zealot and wants to do that, he's also extremely selfish. And rather than, rather than just setting, going and, and kind of fulfilling his commission to destroy everything, 
He wants to rather conquer everything and mold all of reality to his own will. And to do that, though, he's going to need to get access to this, this secret place within uh, where they hold kind of all of the universe's vast magical items and things, that, whether they're weapons or whether they're just tools that he can use to, to remold and remake reality. He can't get in without, uh, without the princess's bloodline, without her kind of her, her f- fingerprint and her, her uh, I guess her will as well. So you can't kind of trick her or, you know, like, uh, like in the movies, chop off her hand and use that as a, you know, on a handprint scanner type of thing. Mm-hmm. She's like, I will, you know, I'll never, I'll, I'll never ally with you. I'll never help you. And Zabe knows that because he, he and the, the princess are very close. But there are also all these different, different variants of the same people. If you're from the prime, you have different copies of yourself in all the different dimensional realities. And there's only one of the princess, and that happens to be Duluth's Claire Jones. And so Zabe goes back. Uh, he slips away to Earth, even though almost all of the rest of his family has is, is been sacrificed and is, uh, in order to prevent this big incursion of this, uh, this, this army that comes against the, uh, the military, the royal family of the Prime. And so he, he sneaks away and he is able to, to get to Duluth. And of course, he comes up and goes, Claire, you don't know me, but I come from a different, I come from a different dimension in reality. Come with me if you want to live. And she's like, Okay, <laughs> I'm going to call the cops now. You better leave. Um, and so he eventually has to, has to kidnap her because Claire has been seduced this whole time by this famous movie star. And so she's kind of living the dream with this, um, kinda this, this Americanized princess story, maybe, mm-hmm. where you've got this famous celebrity that has picked you from some unknown reason, bumped into you on the street, turned out that... Uh, uh, was a was a half sibling or something like that to one of her friends in high school, and that's how she got to know him and began a r- relationship with him. And so this has been a long game by the sorcerer for many years. He's been impersonating the celebrity. Okay, that that was something I didn't pick up on, but I'd like to go back to the copies in sure. the various realities. Um, so, if the copy in one reality does something. Does that affect the copies in all the other realities? Yes and no. In the prime, the prime is kind of, uh, it's kind of the main dimension. And I describe it in the book when, when Zabe is trying to explain it to Claire, because she's, one, she's looking for reasons why this is all crazy and I should turn around and run away. Um, and two, because it's also very interesting. I'm kind of interested in, in knowing about it. So I describe it as if it was a, a gem, a tesseract, uh, which is uh, essentially a cube within a cube connected at the vertexes. Um, so that creates a total of 30 different planes. And each of those planes is a, is a, represents a realm of existence. Okay. But then there, so there's 31 dimensions because the, the, the main one is the prime, which would be the actual substance of the gem itself. And so on the prime, for example, Claire, she's... Um, she, she's a, a variant of Bethia, who's the princess that Zabe's in love with. Okay. And she's very stubborn. She's very strong-headed, but she's also very noble and very proud. And all of her best traits comes out in Bethia. So the prime is connected to all the different variants that might exist in the different dimensions. Okay. That answers a lot of questions because... Um, as we talked off camera, um, I had a very short period of time to read the book. And what helped me was the little notes in italics that said Earth somewhere, in, elsewhere, was, mm-hmm. was the one that I liked, elsewhere. and. Um, what was the other one? Um, a short time later. It helped set, it could be very confusing with, with the names and trying to keep characters straight if that had not been there. That, mm-hmm. was, a, that was a great s- stroke of, of uh, writerly um, craft. Um, and there's one thing that I forgot to put in and intended and... Uh, a reviewer on Amazon actually mentioned it. They're like, 
You know what would have really helped? I'm like, ah, some, for some reason that didn't make it into the final draft would be a glossary. Uh, yes. Would have been immensely helpful, which um, when, I, when I do a new edition of this or the sequel, um, it will have a glossary to kind of explain a lot of those things as well as a, uh, as well as a character list so you can know who's connected to who. Yes, that was the first thing that I looked, looked for and it wasn't there and I thought, <laughs> okay, I need to make a map. So I was sitting with my computer and the book open and going through the various parts that I had read and said, okay, this person is related to this person. Mm -hmm. And I think it would help your readers a great deal when you do that. I'm sure it will, yeah. Um, talk a little bit about this book is not overtly re religious, but there, it is very spiritual. Yes. Can you talk about what informed you to do that with your book? One of my, the, the book is, is almost an homage to Madeline Alengel, who wrote A Wrinkle in Time. Yes. One of my all-time favorite authors. Uh, and in A Wrinkle in Time, if you remember, it was, uh, it was Mrs. Who's It, Mrs. What's It, and uh, what, was the, what was the other one's name? Um, drawn a blank but the the other woman who's taking the the children on this journey and yes. they use the tesseract um, as a way where they were were traveling across the dimensions and so this is a bit of an homage to that even though um, the word tesseract has become very popular because it's it's an item used in the Marvel Cinematic Universe so it's been in a lot of different sci-fi superhero movies mm -hmm. um, but Madeline Alengo wrote a line in and I'm gonna butcher the line because I can't quote it exactly uh, but she wrote something to the effect of um, when they, uh, when the children are going through and they're just amazed, they're like, oh man, we were like taught in church and Sunday school that, you know, like, you know, I can't believe that aliens exist and that these things are out there. And, and um, one of the women said to the, the children, hey, you think an, an amazing and super creative and all powerful God would limit his, his creation to just people? Yes. There's, there's so much more. You are special, but there is much more than you could ever even imagine. Mm -hmm. And so part of this, uh, part, part of that whole, whole thought mentality um, is kind of what drove the book and kind of crafts and informs how, how I use religion um, in the book. Um, so I, it's not overtly religious, but I write everything from my own, like every author does, mm -hmm. uh, personal preferences, beliefs, and my worldview will inevitably find its way into uh, my writing. And some of my other books are much more overtly religious. Um, mm. This one uh, is not. You could be a you could be an atheist and read it and go, this guy must be an atheist, uh, because we'll 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 look at things that we see through our own lens. Um, but if somebody said, oh, this guy, you know, this guy used to be a youth pastor in whatever church, um, they'd be like, oh, yeah, I can see that in in reading this mm. now. Well. I saw when you were talking about the villain, you could relate a lot of things happening today to that villain. You know, you could, you could read into just the general chaos mm -hmm. of today into it's maybe not changes in reality, but it's changes in reality. Mm -hmm. And so, I found that very interesting. If you also notice in the villain, he's very conflicted. He's not conflicted between good and evil like we tend to think. He's conflicted between just really evil and just personal selfishness. Yeah, the selfishness I got because he, one of the scenes with the princess where he has her captive, um, he's so upset because I know the scene. Because she just she is noble even when she is under stress. Mm -hmm. and, and he, and he is it. everything that she is not, and that that really impressed me. Um, there is a line that talks about her as the daughter of the architect king. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. The architect king is kind of this idea of a of a overall grand creator. I, I enjoy um, 
Madeline Olengo. There's a lot of other authors that I also enjoy greatly. I, um, off camera, we're talking a little about C.S. Lewis. The Architect King is kind of an Aslan type of figure. Okay. Um, only unlike, unlike in The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, we don't have this lion that rushes in to save the day. Uh, we do find out that much like when Aslan broke the stone tablet in the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and was, was kind of a sacrifice himself for the Pevensey children, um, the architect king long ago, in order to prevent this overall, this huge civil war between the, the dimensions, uh, which is referenced as this, the Syzygic War, um, which is a, a reference, uh, like a syzygy is um, it's like a lunar type event. And it's during these lunar events that people are able to access the, um, the different uh, dimensional realities. So he sacrificed himself to the, these two guys that are called the Brothers of the Apocalypse. It's Nithogar is one of them, who's the, the, the chief villain. And the other one is his brother, Basilisk, uh, who is, at, after the Syzygic War, suddenly becomes extremely torn by something that isn't really clear in the book, but we'll get, uh, we'll get fleshed out a little more in books two and three. I'm intending this to be a trilogy, and book two mm -hmm. is um, almost done. I uh, should be done within a month or so. I should, be, I should have the first draft completed. Uh, but when the main characters are, are fleeing Nathagar and are kind of traveling between the realms, they're almost, they're almost caught, and so they have to jump blindly wherever they can get, and they wind up in Basilisk's dimension where he is the ruler. It's the homeland of all this, this evil race of people that are chasing them. Some can shape shift. Some have um, abilities like the X-Men to be able to do these, these crazy things, like the one guy who, uh, who can use fire, and he's throwing fireballs, and uh, he's really kind of a neat character. Um, but uh, when they, they wind up trying to not be seen, but they get caught by Basilisk and actually are brought to his castle, where this is like the most important piece in the universe, and he just lets them go. And they're wondering, what, what's the deal? Well, it turns out when they're there, um, there is a statue there, and Basilisk has, kind of as the name implies, the ability to turn people into stone. And there is the architect king. They're like, is that a statue of him? And they're like, no, that's the actual architect king who made a deal with Basilisk to stop the war, which would end all of reality by freezing himself at his own will, because uh, Zabe says, you know, if he wanted to, he could stop, he could break himself out of that stone anytime he mm. wanted. But there is a timeline and there's kind of a prophecy about when that will happen. And all of this is very, is an internal conflict and struggle with Basilisk, which is shown by uh, when they walk around, he's got this, this statue garden full of his conquests of the past. And in between that are all these different game boards, uh, very, very much like a chess game. And all he does to pass the time and has for decades is literally just played chess with himself, like, and none of the games ever resolve because he's he's a master um, strategist, but he can never bring himself to end the thing, um, even though that's his religious devotion is to uh, to the Shlogath, the Agod, the opposite of all reality. It's my religious devotion is to end everything, and yet I can't bring myself to do it. And, uh, because you don't know what that's going to be. Exactly. He's too afraid to take the next step and too afraid to admit that he's afraid. So, mm -hmm. so even my, my villains have kind of some deep internal flaws about them. Well, that's what makes them interesting villains. Mm -hmm. And relatable. And, yes, because if they were um, perfect, they wouldn't be interesting. Uh, what... Can you change, tell me a little bit back on Earth about um, the villain in the museum? The villain in the museum at the beginning of the story? Yes. The villain in the museum, that, uh, that would be Nithogger. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he, he's looking for something. And it actually, um, it kind of, to tie some of the tertiary characters all together, he's in... He's in the, uh, um, there's a professor named Miles Jekima who's a friend of Sam, yeah, Sam Jones, be the name of the, um, Claire Jones' father. Okay. And they, uh, they share kind of, their offices are next to each other, and they both have been studying this ancient book. And nobody could really unravel the language and everything within it. And uh, uh, Nithagar is looking for it, because it turns out it's his journal that was lost 
lost to him long, long ago. And he needs it for a couple of reasons, little things that he's forgotten throughout time on how to, how to open the portal and to call in his non-existing God into existence, which would, is the thing that would tear all reality apart. For something that doesn't exist to exist, is, uh, it's a paradox. Yeah. And that's what would, is the thing that would, would tear apart reality. Mm -hmm. So he's looking for that. He finds uh, there's a guy and he's just, he, he gets caught in the crossfire and uh, is the first victim in the book. Mm -hmm. He's just there picking up an extra shift because he was, he was not uh, as, he was, he was not as responsible as he would have liked in his younger years with college. And now he's having to pick up extra shifts to pay for night classes. And he winds up scared by all of the shadows. And uh, he's kind of jumpy and skittish because he thought he heard something. And he's laughing at himself because, oh, that's, I'm just jumping at shadows. And he turns around. There really is something there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and the thing is, is uh, I, I mentioned the, the pin that he was looking for. There's this kind of an Illuminati type group, which would be the human version of what the bad guys are, are, mm -hmm. uh, are a part of. And uh, it's called the Heptobscurantum. And Heptobscurantum <laughs> I love, is, I love the name. is uh, I, it, it's, it's a pretty cool name. Um, but they're, uh, they're run by this group called the Seven, which uh, Hept means yeah, seven. Right. And uh, um, Obscurantum, which would mean like the hidden seven yeah, is what yeah. it would translate to. So they're this Illuminati-like group. And uh, they have all these followers, these adherents that are kind of secret cultists. And I, one of the other authors that I like is H.P. Lovecraft, who okay. wrote a lot of just classic American psychological terror um, mostly in short story format. And uh, there's a lot of intriguing things about him, but uh, regardless, I, I kind of stole that idea of these different, these secret cultists that are often devoted to some terrifying intergalactic cosmic entity. And so the Heptops Grunt, and one of the guys was a security guard, and he was supposed to be there to kind of show the way to the sorcerer who sneaks in the middle of the night. And so when he's looking at him, he's looking for the pin, and the guy can't breathe when it happens. And he's like, you're not so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, then the guy basically, he, he just never releases the guy, and he suffocates. It's, yeah. Um, so there is this, this secret cabal all throughout the world. And so not, they, they really can't, when, when Claire and Zabe and their friend, who's probably my favorite supporting character I've ever written by the name of Jackie, um, okay, I the, remember her. Jackie is, uh, I actually had somebody email me. They're like, I need to know, is Jackie a real person? By the way, love the book. If she's real, I would seriously like to ask her out on a date. I, I thought that was hilarious. Oh, uh, just, <laughs> like, well, I don't really know you. I'm going to say she's not real just so that it doesn't get awkward. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she's loosely based on a, a couple of people. But um, yeah, so they, they don't really know who they can trust. That's that's what I gathered with um, with the jumping around and uh, the idea that none of this looks real. You start doubting mm -hmm. what what your reality is that that that's real. That's that's the thing that I found the most disturbing. Isn't the right word, but but. Unnerving? It's unnerving. That's a really good word. That's a really good word. There's the scene when she begins to doubt her own sanity. And part of that is, uh, is very specifically what the sorcerer is doing to her, is making her doubt, because he's, he's been telling her a lie for a couple of years as he's slowly seduced her up to the point where now she's, uh, she's, she's ready to get married and his ultimate goal is marry me so now I can re return to the prime with you and then if I kill the princess, Bathia, because you are the same person, you will become the prime. Mm -hmm. My, our child will have access to this place that I need to get. And so he's playing a long-term game, and that's his mm. plan. And is he kind of gaslighting her? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And there, there is certainly, and I feel like when I read it, when, when I get to that chapter where, where that's what's going on, it's after her house burns down and... Mm -hmm. uh, um, the real estate agent that they were working with to buy this great place died in the fire. And she's there. She's beginning to really doubt everything. They're like, no, you didn't even, even telling her like, no, the house wasn't laid out like that at all until she finally, after a while, because he's also done things like taking away her cell phone because oh that got burned up in the fire. And well, I'm a celebrity. I don't like to go out because 
Uh, if, we, if we do, I'm going to get swamped by fans and paparazzi. And so she doesn't have any way really to, to verify anything. But then she is able to find someplace, an older listing online, where she finally gets a cell phone back and discovers that, that uh, um, uh, she, she discovered, I totally forgot what I was saying. <laughs> oh, go for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so she, she discovers that, uh, uh, that she was right. And she wonders, why are people lying to me? Uh, why are they lying to me about just the simplest of things? Because she's, uh, she's really just so confused. But when I'm, when I'm reading it, it feels like it's getting along because I'm, I'm almost believing the lines that she's been fed for a while, too. And, then and she, that's what, that's what the, the, the gaslighting is. Yeah, yeah that, that you are, um, you doubt your own sanity because, you know, things get moved. Uh, Mm -hmm. Things get said that aren't true, but you're led to believe they're true and so forth. Um, well, and in it, what's, what's neat, that's how it slowly, it just ties layer upon layer into, because the, there's all these different worlds and stories that are kind of happening at the same time that right. seem like they're unrelated, but they've got to slowly start tying in. She, she finds the old listing and finds, it has a, a snapshot of what the layout would look at the floor plan. Mm -hmm. And so she saves a screenshot of it and sends it to herself. And because uh, later on she goes to show her friends, she's like, "See, I, I told you I'm not crazy." And the fo the the whole website is down, just with a little message saying, "You know, under construction. It's been purchased by the Heptobscurantum Group, uh, mm -hmm. which is the corporate arm of this, you know, this the, secret cabal." Yeah. And so because she saved something, she's able to go back and like see there is something going on, and that's the turning point uh, for her. Christopher. Is there anything else you'd like to add to our discussion today? I'd love to add. Uh, I have a, a website I would love for people to check out. Um, you can check me out on the internet uh, at um, www.authorchristopherdschmitz.com. I got a blog on there. I'm trying to interact with people as much as I can. Um, this photo that we have in the background is uh, an artist representation of that prime realm that we were talking about. I have a um, kind of a prequel comic book coming out. It's meant as kind of a promotional tool that uh, we're, you're talking about kind of sketching out and mapping out certain things. And this comic book is meant to do that and provide kind of in a graphical format, the, uh, a roadmap for the, all the history behind the prime, where it's going, as well as, uh, as well as a couple of pages of some dialogue and some activity that leads directly into the opening of the book, which opens with a literal explosion so there's already I did the George Lucas thing and just jumped in in the middle of the action um, in this big battle in the beginning of the book and so this kind of has a little bit of the um, the build-up to that uh, as well as talks a little bit more about Zabe and about uh, the royalty of the prime and everything and so it's a it's 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 not really a full-on prequel but it's maybe book one half okay um, and okay. then I've got another book kind of in between this book and then the sequel that, that's happening as well. So I'm trying to make a larger series out of this whole world that I've, that I've created. And I'll be at a bunch of different Comic Cons. I'm hoping to be giving these away um, throughout uh, some Comic Cons in Minnesota. There's one in North Dakota I'm scheduled to be at. Some will be speaking as a panelist. Some will just be there selling books, talking to people, and giving away comic books. Fabulous. Christopher Schmitz, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I thank you for joining us at Mary's Eclectic Interest today. We look forward to seeing you next time.